I, th I, I told you a few weeks ago, that maybe two or three weeks ago, that we should let, uh, well, I felt the, these words that Jesus uh, could uh, explain himself. Let Jesus, he can explain himself. We should let Jesus speak. And so in order for him to speak, we have to use his word. We, we allow his word to speak into our lives. And there's a question raised in the text that I'm going to use today, and it's a well-worn, familiar text. But the question was raised, what sayest thou? What do you have to say? And I think that goes on in our, our culture quite a bit. Everybody wants, well, what do you think about it? <laughs> what do you have to say about it? And, you know, that kind of goes back and forth. And obviously there's a great divide. But there was a, there was a question, and the question was a, a question that was, uh, it was targeted to, to uh, entrap Jesus. It was, a, it, was a, it was a carefully thought out plan that they had to entrap Jesus to kind of get him caught between uh, the Jewish law and the Roman law of the day. And uh, uh, that's what they really cared about. They tried to entrap Jesus with their words. And, but they did raise the question, what sayest thou? Which is a good question. How many of you want to know what Jesus has to say? And I think we should all care about what Jesus has to say about things. I know I do. Watch what he says. Watch what he says. I was told when I was a boy, you better watch your mouth. And I felt like the Holy Spirit spoke to me a few years back. And Watch what comes out of his mouth. Watch what comes out of the mouth of Jesus. So let Jesus explain himself. I uh, heard her speak eight days ago uh, in Linton at a Right to Life banquet. It was Saturday night. And uh, her name was, uh, I think I've pronounced it Dykeson, but it's Dixon. It's Serena Dixon. It's uh, D-Y-K-S-E-N. And you can look her up. You can, you can just Google Serena Dixon and you can find all kinds of things. You'll be able to watch some of the videos that uh, they've done, some interviews they've done. You can find out about her ministry. She was invited down from northern Indiana to speak at the Right to Life Banquet, and I was there. And I was sitting in, uh, toward the back, I guess, and I don't hear well. Everybody knows that. I think Judy came up behind me, and she liked to never got my attention. And I noticed people that were in front of me, they were kind of smiling and laughing. I think she must have been saying my name 25 times. So I finally uh, figured out why they were laughing. They were laughing at me not being able to hear. But I did try to hang on every word and listen to her story. And it was her life story. And uh, it was hard, as uh, Steve Thomas told me. He said it was really hard to listen to her story. And I realize we have some young people. A lot of them went out. But I want to be respectful and, uh, and not go into every, everything about her story. But uh, I, uh, I met her husband. And uh, I got her book, uh, She Found His Grace. Uh, it's available if you would be interested in, uh, in getting it. She Found His Grace. And it chronicles her story, her life story. Her, uh, her speaking stirred me, but uh, obviously by seeing the words and reading the words, I absorbed a lot more of her story by going through the book in a couple of days this week, early Monday, Tuesday. She found his grace, really stirred me to the core. Her story sort of uh, wrecked my heart. Uh, it hit really hard. It, uh, it's uh, extreme trauma. Uh, the, she was victimized uh, when she was... 11 up to the time she was 13 and as a result became pregnant at 13 and and then went through a horrible uh, abortion and uh, her struggle in trying to get beyond her pain from then on was just uh, remarkable it disturbed me it distressed me it uh, well, it was uh, reading the story was really disconcerting and uh, uh, difficult. Uh, you talk about something that makes you uncomfortable. It made me uncomfortable to the nth degree. 
But it, the, the story, as dark as it was for her life, and you just wonder why, why wasn't she protected? Why did it happen to her? You know, the fact is we know it's repeated and it happens too often. And, and uh, it, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't end dark. She, she's amazing. What a story of rescue and redemption. Uh, God raised her up to be a true light in a dark world, and she is a true light on the front lines. I mean ministering to people even on the street. Unbelievable platform that God has given her. And now she, she can reach the world with her story, and in a lot of ways already is. Her story is changing lives. And God, she's sensitive to the Holy Spirit, and uh, the Holy Spirit leads her and guides her and directs her. She's been involved in a lot of good things. Uh, her husband seemed to be a remarkable man as well, and after reading the story, he absolutely is an incredible man. She ministers hope and healing and forgiveness, and something that... Uh, we try to do is we try to speak against abortion and and uh, caution against abortion and we try to put up signs and billboards and try to encourage life i hope most i hope all of you are pro life i don't know in a crowd this size if there there's really not a good reason not to be pro life god is so you ought to be on his side god's for life uh But uh, as far as a ministry to the post-abortive woman, as she calls her, the woman who has been through abortion, she has an incredible healing ministry for the woman that has went. So if you know someone that could benefit in that regard, there needs to be healing. And she didn't find that healing till much later in her life, beyond that 13-year-old experience. It was much later that she really found healing. But, uh, but God, God's a faithful God, and he, uh, He's brought her. God took the broken pieces of her life to make a beautiful minister of God's grace. She found His grace. How many of you are glad to have found God's grace in your own life? The message, I think, uh, is that Jesus transforms lives, and His mercy and forgiveness and grace is still display, displayed in the earth. Uh, it's available for all to see. It's John chapter 8. And uh, the Holy Spirit, I think, impressed me to talk about some women that were impacted by Jesus for the next few weeks. And just like Serena was, uh, I want to be talking to you out of the Bible about some women whose lives Jesus changed, impacted. The first one is in John chapter 8. Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives. And early in the morning, he came into the temple and all the people came unto him, and he sat down, and he taught them. I stand up to teach. He sat down to teach. I'm not sure, but that's how it was in that day. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? What do you have to say? And this they said, testing him or trying him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted himself up and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. And again he stooped down and he wrote on the ground. And they who heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. And when Jesus had lifted himself up, and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? And she said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. What a remarkable story. It is, uh, 
it is a favorite of mine because I think it puts the grace uh, and the forgiveness and the transformation that Jesus can bring to one's life on display. The Pharisees are seeking to discredit Jesus. They didn't care, obviously. They didn't care anything about the woman. They were concerned about entrapping Jesus. And so uh, they wanted to have a accusation against him, kind of catch him between the Jewish law and the Roman law, kind of set him up. It was a set-up deal. So this is a trap they set for him to see if he would violate or dishonor the law of Moses. And it was early in the morning, it says, and all the people came to him. Do you ever wonder why they came to Jesus? You know, they wanted to hear what he had to say. I, I think people still ought to have an appetite for the words of Jesus. They wanted to hear what he had to say. Some people have a voracious appetite for what everybody else has to say. I'm telling you, you ought to have a great appetite for the words of Jesus. And I pray that God would whet that appetite for, for you to really seek the words of Jesus in your own life. They wanted to hear what he had to say because never a man spoke like this man. I hope you have a great desire to hear the words of Jesus. His words will change your life completely. Jesus sat down and taught them, it says, and, and then there's this interruption as he was teaching. His teaching was interrupted by the scribes and the Pharisees making a spectacle, spectacle out of an adulterous woman. She is paraded publicly and charges are leveled against her. Her partner in crime is suspiciously absent. It's a setup. It's just her, not him. Surely crushed by the weight of shame. Frightened about what was happening and what would happen or could happen. It was scary for her, I know. It had to be. Was her life in jeopardy in the moment? Well, it sure looks like it. She's presented for judgment and she hears what's being said. And they cited the law of Moses. And she was to be stoned to death according to the law of Moses. But the question was, what sayest thou? What does Jesus have to say in the situation? And Jesus is asked for his opinion. The scribes and Pharisees pretend to entrust judgment to Jesus. That's not, that's a farce. It's, a, it's about entrapping, it's about discrediting. It's about damaging and destroying his reputation they want to be able to accuse Jesus. She's only being used, she's only being used by these hypocrites pretending to care about the moral purity of the region. That's not true. When their only intent is to destroy Jesus, this is the spirit of Antichrist on display. What sayest thou? What sayest thou? Let's watch what Jesus does. Let's watch what he has to say. Let's watch what comes out of his mouth. What sayest thou? What would he say in a situation like this? I tell you, we desperate, as a nation, don't we desperately need to hear the words of Jesus? As a people, as a church, don't we desperately need to hear what Jesus has to say? I stand before you today, and I tell you that Jesus' words have changed my life. That's my testimony. And His words are still changing my life. His words do change lives. I hope you care about what Jesus has to say. Instead of speaking though, when He's asked, He doesn't. He stoops down to write in the dirt, in the sand. And He wrote on the ground. And it's a mystery about what he wrote, their question was met with silence and he stoops down and he writes. And it reminds us, I think, here is the Son of God. Not everybody realizes it that day, but we know that with the finger of God, the tablets of stone for Moses was provided. And Jesus writes in the sand and the dirt. He doesn't immediately answer his interrogators he bends down and he writes something with his finger on the ground. Some have speculated if it was, 
If it was meaningful, we'd know what it was. We don't know what it is, so therefore it's not an integral part of the story. I kind of disagree with that, but I'm, I'm used to disagreeing with people sometimes. He, he writes, uh, I think he wrote something. I don't think he was doodling. He bends down, he writes something with his finger on the ground. Some have speculated perhaps the sin of the accusers. Maybe he was naming names, particular sins. Maybe he, like God, writing on tablets of stone, wrote the law out in the sand. We don't know if he wrote the Ten Commandments out there that day for everyone to see, to be confronted with the Word of God. It was kind of amazing there a few years ago. We had this deal where we, we, did, we, weren't, we didn't want our classrooms to have the Ten Commandments up. That might, that might harm children, you know. And, or we, we didn't want it in Bedford. They didn't want it downtown. They didn't want it right where it was. We had to, they had to move it. Ten Commandments monument. Can't have something like that where somebody might see it. You know, the Word of God. Let's hide that away. Well, Jesus, he writes something we don't know. I got an idea it was significant, though. And they continued asking him. They pressed him. They pressed the line of questioning. They wanted answers, and they wanted answers now. Jesus lifts himself up, and he, as he stood up, this time he speaks. There's something coming out of his mouth. And he says, he that is without sin among you, that's among the accusers, let him first cast a stone at her. Are they armed and at the ready? Do they have rocks in their hands? I don't know. Some have suggested they probably did. And then it says again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Again. And perhaps he wrote the sins of the accusers. God's uh, Holy Spirit has a way of convicting us of our sin. And I believe that was a convicting moment for those accusers. You know, these guys thought they were smart and they were going to entrap Jesus and discredit Jesus. But if Jesus had chosen an academic debate with these interpreters of the Mosaic Law. How many of you believe he who wrote the Mosaic Law would have come out on top? You know, I don't know that you can enter into a debate with Jesus and win it. I had a person tell me one time, said, well, so-and-so debated me. I'm pretty sure who's going to win. And, and they were speaking of themselves. Well, we can be confident in our skills, but uh, we're no match for Jesus. And Jesus didn't enter into that kind of debate. His words were few, which may be a good thing for us to model. And uh, God only knows what was written on the ground and those that attended that day. And it's one of those things I, I think I want to know in, in eternity. I'm going to try to find that one out. I believe we can. How many of you think we can find things out on the other side? You say, well, it's not going to matter. Well, you're probably right, but I'm still kind of curious now. It was an awkward time of quietness, and conviction occurs. And conviction can occur. It can happen right in a church house. I've seen it happen. My mind goes back suddenly to, to a meeting we were having, and it was pre-1983 because my little brother was still alive, and he had come down and he was given a, his testimony and it must have been on a Friday or Saturday night. I think it was a Saturday night. And there was a lot of young people in the Crane Village Church that night. And he talked about his life and how he had made a mess of his life and how he'd come back to the Lord. And it was just really anointed testimony, just personal. The power of personal testimony sometimes is so persuasive as the Holy Spirit uses it. And there were people that responded. There's a number of people who gave their heart to Jesus, stretched across the front of the little church. But there was also a man that was sitting back in there somewhere in the old Crane Village Church. And God was dealing with him. 
And I promise you, I watched him. He was holding on and, and shaking, and he refused. He refused to come to Jesus, and he's lived his life, as far as I know, up until this day, without Jesus. I hope I'm wrong. I hope sometime in there that I'm not aware of, he's come to Jesus. But that conviction can come on a person and I believe conviction came on those accusers. And Jesus stood back up again and he looks and he sees only the woman. And he has a question for her. And he asks, has no man condemned you? And she says, no man, Lord. And now Jesus directs his words to the woman. And he speaks words that are transforming they are powerful words life-changing words he speaks life to this woman her nightmare of public exposure is now covered suddenly with his love she could have been stoned she could have been executed instead she was saved she is safe i don't know how much safety she's felt in her life but now she's with a man she suddenly feels safe with. She is safe. And her life is no longer in jeopardy. And there's one reason her life is not in jeopardy. And that is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. She'd been caught in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong man. And she surely was terrified by what was happening. It was a veritable nightmare for her. Her sin exposed, paraded in the temple, made a spectacle of. She was embarrassed. She was humiliated. It was off the charts. It was shameful. She was horribly frightened as she faced a sentence of death. The religious leaders seemed so bent on executing her. And under the law of Moses, she knew they were right. She deserved to die. But this day, Jesus stood between her and certain death. This day, Jesus stood up for a sinful woman. Jesus stood up to offer her forgiveness. And if Jesus stands up for anything, He stands up for our forgiveness. He wants us to be forgiven. He wants us to be restored. Jesus specializes in restoring broken people. People who have failed. He offers us a new beginning, a fresh start. He can usher in a new day in your life. Starting now, at this very moment, Jesus offers transformation. He didn't excuse her sin. In fact, He said, go and sin no more. He offered her a life above sin. A, a life that, was, that would contain power to say no to the way she had been living her life. He offered a brand new way of living her life. He offered her forgiveness for her past, and I think power for her future. She empower, he was empowering her to live a life she had never lived. And that's what Jesus does when He saves us. Power to live differently. He said, go and sin no more. And it's all about mercy, and it's all about grace, and it's forgiveness and restoration and a new beginning. We've all failed. I'm glad He simply doesn't discard us and throw us away. He doesn't consider us trash. He certainly doesn't. Jesus will stand up for you. He will stand up for you now. Some of you are needing Jesus to stand up for you in your particular situations right now. And you have an advocate with the Father. And it's Jesus Christ the righteous. And He will stand up for you. Now the law said we should die. And that's true. And Jesus stands between us and certain death. But Jesus literally takes the hit for us. The wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. But it says the gift of God, say the gift of God, is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We deserve to die and be separated, but Jesus has offered us a gift of reconciliation. Now she was caught in the very act, it says, I think it was probably staged. It was a setup. They did this. It was a, it was a conspiracy uh, that uh, was orchestrated. She, she was abused. She was, she was so uh, 
mistreated in this uh, whole situation. God has one strategy for breaking the power of shame over our lives, for freeing us from the shackles of shame. That one strategy is an encounter with Jesus Christ. And I believe that Jesus certainly reveals God's mercy to us. The woman without Jesus, you know, could have died easily in her shame. But because of Jesus, she did not die in her shame. In fact, Jesus blots out the shame of this adulterous woman. Instantly, her shame is gone. And she is sent forth to go and live a brand new way. She was released to begin again. And instead of shame on you, for her, it was shame off me. And uh, it will only happen because of Jesus. Uh, Did you ever notice that it's more comfortable to focus on someone else's sin than it is to confront our own? They saw a sinner that day. They didn't see their own sin. They saw a woman. They'd staged it. They'd exploited her to the nth degree. But uh, Jesus saw a woman of worth. He saw past her sin. I'm, I'm glad when Jesus looks at us, He sees past our sin. He sees us as redeemable. He saw a woman of worth. Not what she had done, but what she could become. Uh, they saw her sin. But with the words and the presence of Jesus, they, uh, they're now seeing their own. They felt it. It was heavy. I think the rocks dropped if they had them. They began to walk away. I think with their heads down. Now you've got to know she was not suspected of a crime. She's not a person of interest. She was guilty. She was guilty. She had violated God's law, and she deserved death. But Jesus speaks these words into her life. Neither do I condemn thee. Jesus did not come to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He said, go and sin no more. He knew knew her sin, and uh, he wasn't winking at her or acting like it was a trivial matter. He instructed her to go and leave her life of sin, which, by the way, requires repentance. She would repent, and that means to turn from her sin and go in the power of the words of Jesus. You know, for all their conniving and all their wickedness, these Pharisees, you know, John was right. They were a bunch of snakes, right? Right? They did something right. They got a woman that needed Jesus into his presence. God used them them rascals to get a woman where she needed to be. For the first time, uh, she was in the presence of the one who could change her life completely. This adulterous woman. They didn't care about her. They did not care about her at all. But they got her into a situation that would change her life. Well, it's amazing what God can do to get us where we need to be in a timely manner to change our lives. She was not innocent of the charges. She was caught in the act. She was quite guilty. Guilt was established. Everyone knew it. She was convinced of her own sinfulness, I'm sure. But she was not beyond the scope of God's forgiving power. And Jesus doesn't set aside the requirements of the law, but rather... You need to understand this. Uh, He accepts her penalty. Uh, Somehow he takes it upon himself. And only about a year later, he would hang on the cross for that woman's act of adultery and her other sins. All of her other sins. He would die on the cross for her sins. He paid for her sins. 1 Peter 2.24 says, who his own self bore our sins in his own body. If you've sinned today, you need to know that Jesus bore your sins on the cross and you can be forgiven. 
I close by telling you that God specializes in restoring broken people. Eight days ago, I heard the story of a little girl whose life was broken in a dysfunctional family. And at 11 years of age, she began to be abused by an uncle. And at 13, became pregnant and then was taken to an unlicensed abortion clinic and one of the worst abortion doctors in history in northern Indiana. Treated her horribly and hurt her in a violent abortion. Could she recover? Boy, it didn't look like it. Could she get better? Could she live? She's living proof of God's grace. God specializes in restoring broken people. He takes lives, the lives of people who have failed, and He brings them to a new day, a new beginning, to victory and fruitfulness and fullness. Thank you for listening to me today. I appreciate your attendance. I, uh, I'm glad for a place that I can come and proclaim the word of the Lord. Just remember there are hurting people all around you wherever you're at. It could be, it could be at work. It could be in the classroom. It could be on the street. It could be at the ball game. There are people that need this kind of an encounter with Jesus Christ. And uh, God may use you to help someone find what they desperately need. Let's give Him praise for the grace and the forgiveness that's come to our lives. The healing that's come to our own lives. Aren't you glad for Jesus today? Father, thank You for these people. I pray Your blessings upon them. I give You glory. I give You praise. In Jesus' mighty name, Amen.